car, you know. We're recording now, Gary? All right. Well, welcome to episode 107, Convos on the Pedicab. We're here with Dr. Fred McGee. We're excited to have you back. Well, I'm um, glad to be back on the pedicab. Yeah, it's, it's uh, exciting. Alex, it's, it's been, been a, it's been a been couple years. It's been, it has been a couple years almost. It's been kind of crazy. Um, since we last spoke, I bought a house. You know, I've been uh, kind of growing my uh, social media profile a little bit with these uh, city council meetings yeah. and the school board doing a little bit of uh, it's called culture jamming. <laughs> culture jamming. Yeah, it's called culture jamming. I'm an old fart man now. It's I, called it's called behave. It's it's called um when the people that are governing you are past the point of actually reasoning with. The only <laughs> thing you can do is just openly make fun of them, and so that's where we are. So that's what I've been doing. Mockery, yeah, yes, mockery. <laughs> I, I, you know, hey, <laughs> mocking politicians in a fine tradition. It's 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 been around for centuries. Oh. Probably millennia. Yeah. You know, I imagine there were some of the people who built the pyramids who were mocking the pharaohs. Do you see there are all these memes where it's like, you know, like those like crying, like liberal, the, the crying, like leftist memes that are like <laughs> screeching and crying with like the tears and like the NPC type memes and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then seem- there's like the Chad that looks at them just making fun of them. And then you see like the pyramid art that almost mirrors the exact same <laughs> things. And it's like, have yeah. you been mocking us since the beginning of time? And it's like, yes. Oh, yeah. Ancient, you <laughs> yes. know, ancient Rome is filled with this type of stuff. I mean, there's actually studies, academic studies of this stuff. You see some of it in the Roman case in the HBO miniseries Rome. What, yeah, I haven't seen any of that. But yeah, it's good I, stuff. I think that we are um, mirroring a lot of s- similar traditions to the fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Like devaluing, car- devaluing our currency. Um, well, I don't know about every, that one, but yeah. well, no, they did with the with the dinero. They they devalued the de- the dinero and used like progressively less amounts of silver and and did things to make it a lot easier to mint Roman dineros um, throughout the fall of the empire. Um, well, I mean, that was something that did happen. <laughs> Roman monetary policy, uh, I think, has is is considerably different from what happens what's happening now. I mean, first of all, they had hard money back then and. They had disproportionately much larger military to support. They had an empire that was stretched too far, just like ours is. But we now, in our capitalist neoliberal age, have economic tools at our disposals uh, that the Romans could only dream about. So, you know, the Roman Empire, which existed for a long time. Well, like a thousand years, right? Or something like uh, that. Well, yeah, well, Rome was founded, of course, yes. But, you know, the empire didn't really come into being until Augustus, Caesar Augustus. Okay the adopted son of uh, Julius Caesar um, created the empire after Caesar was assassinated in, on the Ides of March in 44 BC. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a good 500 years, a good five, 600 year run. And then, of course, you had the creation of Byzantium, which was the eastern portion of the Roman Empire, and that persisted until the Middle Ages. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, there were a lot of reasons why the empire fell apart. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd say most of the scholarly consensus is it was a combination of uh, the empire just extending itself too far, and also inequality. I well, mean, the Roman Empire was a very unequal society. Well, any anything anything that becomes an empire that usually is how things kind of work. <laughs> um, to say the least. Yeah, <laughs> but when when you stretch, I'm talking yourself, about in internal terms. I'm talking about actual Roman citizens, well, of not course. just colonial subjects. Uh, of course, because when you metropolis. build an empire, you, you're spending more money. Um, you spend more time and resources trying to build your empire and consolidate more power than you do helping your own people. Because if you were trying to focus on helping your own people, you wouldn't have the resources or the ability to build an empire to the scale that you built that empire. Well, the way it generally works is is you have to keep expanding. Yes. You have to keep getting more, 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 more. The idea is is that a rising tide lifts all boats. That's the sort of the intellectual origin of, of that phraseology. But, uh, and the Roman Empire was able to expand for hundreds of years. Um, right. But then finally, you know, militarily, um, Central Europe started to achieve military victories. You know, the key to Rome's empire was its army, its military, and its navy. I mean, and you know. In the Punic Wars, you know, it took on the dominant maritime power of its day, Carthage, and ultimately prevailed. They were destroying, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah. But what we were saying in terms of, like, monetary policy and, and extending themselves, 
um, because we're, we're uh, this is fascinating stuff, but we're not here to talk about the Roman, you know. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, right, anyway, move, right. But what, what, what we're saying, <laughs> what we're saying though, is that like when you have to um, overextend yourself because you're overextending your military, um, a lot of countries when they feel overextended, they will print up more money and devalue their currency to. Um, you know, compensate for overextending themselves. Well, that's a common recipe for inflation. Yes, okay. that, that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, infl- you know, I don't, I don't think inflationary policy, I mean, it's sort of engaging in presentism to take a look at stuff that's discussed today in, the, in our modern economic era and go back to ancient Rome and say that, well, they were pursuing inflationary monetary policies. The truth is, is that there were a lot of different currencies in the Roman Empire. They had a whole range of different things going on. There were pockets of you know, microeconomic activity, Rome exercised shrinking control over the distant reaches of its empire over the course of, of, of time. The United States today, which is the dominant imperial force in the world, maintains impressive control still over much of its domains. I mean, you know, we're in almost half the countries on Earth. We have hundreds of military bases everywhere. Yeah, there's an embassy everywhere here. It's, 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 it's yeah, impressive. It's, it's, well, it's not an embassy. I'm talking about military forces. I'm yeah. talking about outright outposts of of empire. Uh, well, there's no need for that. Well, there, there, of, well, there yeah. never has been. But well, it depends. I mean, the United States, of course, has developed a complicated ideology, pretty much since its inception. About you know, and they, people call it American exceptionalism. This idea that the United States, you know, almost stands outside of history. That it's you know the right, the most righteous nation in the history of the world, and it by definition has the authority. And the righteousness behind that authority to go into other places and far flung reaches and corners around the globe and tell those places how to live. Well, I think that um, after these past couple of years, I, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, right? Um, but I think that after these past couple of years and looking at what's been going on and what is continuing to occur, um, there's no place I'd rather be than in the United States right now. And I also think that with what you're saying, you you also have a, a big trend of people that are extremely rich, like all just oligarchical type figures, like the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, you know, the J.P. Morgan, starting from them, that have infiltrated um government that, that have infiltrated the governments to a point where now when the government does its bidding and says they're doing things for America, they're not doing things for America. They are doing things to benefit J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so that that's what I think is kind of, you know. Or the next big mega corporation, because every time we, almost every time we do um, an economic policy or engage into an allyship or a friendship with another region, or pretend to have a humanitarian disaster, it's always to fuel the interests of some mega corporation behind it. Well, what did what did Woodrow Wilson say? Oh no, sorry, Calvin Coolidge. Well, w- w- Wilson said that he unwittingly ruined uh, the country when he made the Federal Reserve. Uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. You know, clearly, you're reading some. Conspiratorial nonsense. <laughs> okay. Um, Calvin Coolidge, who was president in the Roaring Twenties, said, you know, the business of America is business. In other words, what's he defined literally the function of government is what's good for the rich and the powerful. That's actually been true since America's inception. And remember, the so-called founding fathers were not representative of the actual population. They were rich white men. I mean, George Washington was the richest man at the Constitutional Convention. He wasn't just a general who sailed across the Delaware and all this other shit. He was a rich guy who had tremendous amount of land in Western Virginia, as did Jefferson and the others who were planters, the Northerners as well. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, had huge amounts of money, comparatively speaking, and supported you know what later would become our monetary policies. What's good for business, as opposed to the agrarian kind of philosophies that Jefferson, uh, you know, uh, supported. Well, Jefferson and Hamilton had different economic viewpoints. Oh, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I was saying. I mean, you know, the Treasury Department. I mean, there's a reason why Hamilton is on the money, and why he was the first Secretary of the Treasury. Okay, uh, and and this is talked about sort of in American History 101. You know, sort of the differing views. At the Constitutional Convention, you, you don't necessarily get as much education in the views of more populist figures such as Thomas Paine or even interestingly, you know, um, the guy who ended up killing Hamilton, Aaron, Aaron Burr, Burr. Yeah. OK, who in many ways was the most sophisticated member of all of these people. I didn't okay. know that. I always thought that he was kind of like oafish. No, that was what I no, thought. That's you know? his reputation. And Hamilton and his supporters made 
made it very plain that, you know, I mean, accusing people, what was funny too back then is like accusing people of incest seemed to be like a big thing back then. Like you, you never could outright say it, but it was like hinted at. It was almost like Game of Thronesy. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Aaron Burr was accused of committing incest with uh, a daughter of his, you know, and of course that accusation was lobbed at Jefferson as well. And it turned out to be true in Jefferson's case. So, you know, I mean, stuff has always been bare knuckle, bare fisted, but you know, the United States was modeled explicitly on certain aspects of Rome and other countries. It was, you know, the age of enlightenment. There are many, many wonderful things that came out of the constitutional convention that established the United States of America, particularly the overthrowing of hereditary titles uh, and systems of monarchy of of of, Ro of, uh, of what existed in Europe at that time, uh, and so there were many aspects of the Constitution as they developed it that were quite enlightened. But I think it's telling that you know the first ten amendments it had to be amended right away, <laughs> and the first ten amendments, you know, sort of the so-called Bill of Rights, tell you something. Those things should have been in the Constitution itself, not as amendments. Okay. But, of course, they wanted to have a document that could pass, that could be adopted by all 13 uh, colonies that eventually would become states. So, you know, I get it. But in any case, yeah, the Gilded Age is, I think, a useful analogy. And we have inequality now in America, not seen since that period. But the floor has risen, okay? The floor has uh, risen substantially. You know, so, you know, we don't have bread lines, as it were, like we, you know, like we had in the Great Depression. And, you know, we don't have workhouses like we had in the late 19th century. We've had since child labor laws enacted. We have the five-day work week, the eight-hour work day. These are, these are advancements, but they had to be fought for. Uh, they had to be fought for by people in unions and in other sorts of uh, organizations. So things have risen, and primarily because of those achievements. That said, things are still miserable for people who are at the bottom end of the income and wealth distribution in America. I mean, most people I, have no idea how hard it is to live these I days. I think that happiness is a is a is a kind of a broad construct because there's also a threshold. Like, there's also like insane amounts of misery that's levied upon people that are way at the top of the the economic echelon too. And I've I've read studies misery that, like, for people at the top. Oh yeah, there's always like, but it's a, it's a different set of misery. Like if you see people that are super rich, they're more like like there's always a higher likelihood of like drug overdose oh, fuck and that. dependencies. I don't give a fuck and... about those people. No, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just making a I'm making an illustration. Fuck that. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to sympathize with Elon. I'm fucking not. Musk. I'm not sympathizing. Fuck with that. that pussy. Okay, okay. I'm not trying to. That's that's not the purpose of this. What I'm trying to say is that hap like, um, there is like a happy medium to like optimize for optimizing happiness with from having money and like that. That medium is like around seventy to a hundred. Like having seventy to a hundred thousand dollars a year from like reading numerous studies is like the financial range that people, generally speaking, are the most happy. Oh no, no. I mean, well, happiness is a subjective measure, you know. And it, <clears throat> I mean, you want, you know, we used to have this thing in, in America called the middle class. You know, this idea: you're not too rich, you're not too poor, you're in the middle. You, that was this thing that America has used for a long time as an ideological construct. And, you know, its heyday was in the 50s and 60s, where you could, if you behaved, quote unquote, uh, go to college, ride out of college, get a job that could buy a house, support a two car garage, maybe a boat, get married, have kids. That stopped being the case definitively, probably by the end of the 1980s, early 90s. My generation, Generation X, is probably the last generation that could have done that. And even then it was kind of already starting to be in decline. Since then, it's been dog eat dog. I, you know, millennials, you know, the, the millennials now are starting to enter their forties and they grew up, they've known nothing but Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and Barack Obama and people like that. And I feel sorry for them to a certain extent. I understand their anger. I understand their frustration, but you know, they have a duty to understand how we got to this place and to also realize that it's the product of historical forces and historical decisions. And they shouldn't be, you know, so quick necessarily to lob complaints against people, well, the boomers per se, although the believe me, the boomers deserve plenty of Well, blame. I think it depends on and, which boomer you were, though, because you also had boomers that went to Vietnam and just got sacrificed in Vietnam with no, to just come home and get spit on while a bunch of, like, you know, while a different class of boomers just wound up making laws and writing policy and advocating for things that are leading us to the predicament that we're, we're poor in. people. Yeah. The people yeah, who yeah. got sent, people who were drafted to go to Vietnam were poor people and people of color. 
just black, oh, no doubt. Of black people, of Mexicans, yeah. indigenous people. You know, you, the list is you know, they were the ones who went and did the fighting. You know, there's a saying. It's been true for a long time. Rich man's war, poor man's fight. Simple as that. No, agreed. Agreed. Um, do you think that like taking us off like the gold standard in in the 1970s with Bretton Woods kind of helped kind of like exacerbated this trend of inequality? No. You don't I, think so? No? No. And that's the consensus. We, you asked me this the last time. I, my position hasn't changed. No. Did I talk about that? I don't a, know if that, I talked about Bretton Woods. You did. That's I a did. favorite talking point among certain people in libertarian <laughs> land and conservative libertarian land. land. <laughs> okay. It's bullshit. <laughs> Why? Okay. okay. That is not how economics works. Can you explain that? Because I'm... Uh, I, if you could explain that again to refresh my memory, that'd, I'd, that'd be great. Well, I got to give you some history there. Okay. okay. I mean, in the late 19th century, this issue came up in the debates about hard money versus soft money. Um, remember, the populists were beginning to be a force at that time. And there were silver mines in Colorado that were opening up. Yeah. And, um, you know, they favored print mining more more precious metals, mining more silver in this particular case. Yeah. Because there were limited amounts of gold. And well, gold, it's a lot easier to mine silver you know, than gold. It is. And, 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 you know, that really could have added to the ability of the uh, United States to print more money because it would have been backed by, again, hard metal. Yeah. Okay. And that would have helped farmers. That would have helped farmers who were hurting a lot at that time because commodity prices had decreased dramatically. That's what lay behind the agrarian populist revolts of the 1880s, 1890s, okay, is that farmers were, were just losing money hand over fist at that time, and the government wasn't really willing to do anything about it. So they supported these, uh, these, these policies, okay? It didn't happen, okay? It didn't happen for a range of reasons that were simple to understand back then because we still had uh, monetary policy that was backed by the gold standard and other metals, uh, when we when Bretton Woods happened and we decided to demonetize or remove that requirement, money became more flexible. We're able to do more things with it. The, the, the idea that money has to be backed by metal or some other precious commodity was always an illusion because money itself is an illusion. And, you know, what's happened since with information technology should make that very clear. Um, you know, we can do things now with money as governments that we could not do before Bretton Woods, and they have, by and large, improved the lives of millions of people. Um, so I'm not one of these people who favors going back to, to the gold standard. You know, we have to live in certain things that Wall Street does, you know, actually are good. Not everything, because, you know, disproportionately they benefit, they rig the game, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to overcome this obsession with this idea, this old fashioned idea that money needs to be pegged to uh, needs to be pegged to metal or some other precious commodity. I think that sound money. I, listen, I, I, I kind of there's some stuff I agree with. Right. And one of the things I like, let's start with what I do agree with. Right. And it's that if you all of a sudden went back to gold, to a gold standard, everybody's assets and everybody's portfolios and everybody's like 401ks would completely um, implode on themselves. Because oh, yeah, possibly. They, they would, no, I, I think that's a, that's almost a, a definite certainty is that it, it would implode in itself well, we because when, when your money isn't backed by anything, um, the value of it is owning, backed, it is it's backed by the full faith and credit of the government. Yeah, so it's backed by force. Not force, no. The well, full, it's backed by us being the number one reserve currency, and the reason that we're the number one reserve currency is because we have a gigantic empire. Well, yes, well, that's been true for a long time. That's so, not, there's nothing unusual about that. So then, once we lose our status as the number one as the number one world superpower. Um, our status is the the dollar status is the number one reserve cu currency will um, also no longer exist, and then we're going to no. have a monetary system that's backed by nothing, and it no. could create a cascading no. effect. You don't think so? No, no. First of all, the United States is not in any existential difficulty as far as its empire. I consider that to be bad because I'm somebody who considers himself to be something of an anti-imperialist. I don't like the idea of the United States going to other places, extracting their natural resources. I agree with you. I agree with you. On so, that I, fully, so yeah. but that's not the same as saying that, you know, uh, what, what you just said, you know, a lot of things would need to be the case before we reverted back to an earlier era in history. Uh, it's in periods of uncertainty when there is more horizontality in terms of who runs the world that people start looking for hard sources of money. OK, um, the United States is in a hegemonic position around the world and in spite of the efforts of countries such as China and Russia to challenge the status of the United States' money as the reserve currency for the world, 
you know, that is nobody serious believes that the United States' currency is under threat. And, and actually, in, in, at, in existential terms, if you look at the chart, the DXY is actually going up through. Like, if you look at like the DXY compared to other currencies, the dollar currency index is actually skyrocketing. Oh, well, you know, the euro is now at one dollar. Yeah. Okay, which is that's pretty interesting. I mean, over the course since its creation, you know, I grew up in Germany when we still had yeah. marks, Deutschmarks. Okay. You know? Well, but so since the creation of the euro uh, in the early 1990s, it was the EQ before that. You know, it's always been worth, quote unquote, more, cl- sort of closer to the British pound, as it were, than to the dollar. But yeah. now it's value. So, you know, look, these things tend to fluctuate. The, the geopolitics do have an influence upon these things. But on balance. Yeah. I think a lot of what, what's happening, though, I think a, a reason that this is happening, too, is that a lot of what, like, Europe is doing with its energy, with, with like, its energy prices and how they're, like, dealing with, like, energy and gas and farming is probably having a... a a role in that effect well we know that for sure that's because of russia you well, know I, russia i mean most european countries relied on russian gas yes okay and russia has turned off the spigots and you know the amount of uh, gas that they're getting from the united states and from places like cotter uh is not making up for the difference they're good there are you know winter is coming for Europe. Oh, it's going to be me. bad. The the elect the um electrical costs are, are looking like a meme stock with how No, it's horrible. Yeah, with, it's with horrible. The, it's the, absolutely the, horrible. Uh you know, certainly the politicians in the UK, the Tories in particular are just talking out of the side of their neck. They're they're living in a complete I mean, it's just complete la la land. There are going to be deaths. There's going to be misery, uh inflation, the combined effects of this energy crisis with inflation and a bunch of other things. That's why people are going on strike in the UK right now. Yeah, but they're also like trying to do all these green policies in the US or talking about doing these green policies with like the climate bill, not at scale as they are in America. Um, huh? What are you talking about? You're talking about in the UK? No, here in America. What? Which, well, with the what climate, you... like doing the like the climate bill and like. You're talking about the inflation reduction? Yes. Rate? I'm talking about stuff no, like that. No. No, you don't think so. I know there was so. a section in the bill that t- that's like limiting nitrogen production for far- for farmers and big agriculture producers. <laughs> and like once you start limiting nitrogen production and stuff like that, you will make commodities and food and stuff like oh. that a lot. You don't think so? No, no. Look, that's, I mean that's look, okay. You, look, you know the the certainty of this world's climate changing uh, in a way to make make life on Earth more difficult and adverse is as certain as rain and waterfalls and as certain as for smoke to rise. Okay? You cannot ignore it. You cannot deny it. You cannot live in a la-la fantasy world. This shit is, it needs to be addressed. Okay. It needs to be mitigated. How would you address it if you were if you were in charge or if you were um, the head of a governing body or an influential member on the board of a governing body or an NGO? That's a hell of a question. It is it? Well, you're a hell of a guy. You're a really <laughs> smart man. I want to know. Like, how would you address it? How would you address it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we would need to change the political economy of the world. We would need to have economic systems that reinforce, uh, uh, you know, cultural and environmental and ecological well-being instead of private profit. In other words, we would need to degrow the economy to match what uh, eco- what ecological systems uh, tell us we should be. Able to what would doing. what would degrowing the economy look like? Well, it would mean, among other things, um, basically saying that economic activity needs to be done in an environmentally healthy way and that uh, private profits do not matter more than the health, safety, well-being and quality of life of people. Sure. So, uh, you know, that would mean essentially confronting many of the sacred cows in American economics and and government and policy, namely oil and gas. You would have to confront the tech industry and you would in particular have to confront the real estate industry. Uh, I think real estate's a big deal because they overbuild and they will build next to water supplies. Well, it's um, not just that. It's, you know, the, that is the, the supply chains upon, because remember, Real estate is still real to a large extent. It's become much more financialized than it ever was. But at the end of the day, stuff still gets built. I mean, where we're sitting right now, which clearly has been subjected to fire damage. <laughs> yes, it has. We had a fire. It made the news, actually, yeah, I didn't uh, know. four years ago. <laughs> yeah. In 2018, we had an actual fire. It made the news. Yeah, this is unsafe. But that's okay. Well, you know. that's fine. You know, nothing's happened I yet. I don't expect to, you know, I, you know, this one here, 
survived the damage nicely. Thank you for sitting me next to one yeah. that didn't burn down. Of course. But, you know, real estate, in order to be real, I mean, you talked earlier about, you know, uh, sound money policies. You know, real estate uh, ideally is still the foundation upon which the financialization of that of that thing takes place. Uh, and that's also under threat and under attack. You know, I and mean, that's what was exposed in the real estate crunch of 2007, 2008, is that, you know, CDOs and all these other sorts of ways to financialize mortgages turned out to be a bunch of bullshit. It was like putting it through a meat grinder and the accountability grew less and less. Um, so anyway, but in terms of what it does, in terms of the harmful impacts it can have on the environment, the key here is, is that housing is a commodity and not something that is done for human need. And that's what I'm talking well, about. Well, BlackRock and all these uh, investment firms are buying up swaths of real estate. Mm -hmm. And um, you should pro that should probably be illegal. Well, real estate, uh, you can make the case that real estate shouldn't exist. Okay. I think owning it's private property and owning a home is fine, and people should own their own home. Eh, I don't know about no, that. No, I, I definitely think so because you have a stake in what you're doing. Yep. What, I do th what I do think they should get rid of is they should not be allowing um, – the only, the only time anybody should own a home, I believe, is for you to live in that home. Yeah. That's it. Like, if you're not living in that home, you, there's have to be a different set of rules for, um, you know, like buying a, a rental property versus buying a home to live in. Like, th that's something that I could see, I could see being. Well, you made. get two, or like in the or, US, you get two, or far like foreign entities shouldn't be buying homes in in America. I don't think, or like, yeah, cor large mega corporations or banking firms should not be buying up swaths of houses like the houses like BlackRock is doing all over America. Oh yeah, well yeah. I mean, you know. A that was a statistic I think uh, somebody pointed out to me this week. Uh, in Austin, a quarter of all real estate transactions were by investors and flippers. Yeah. Okay. These people had no desire. They, they didn't even look at the house. No. They just they just had a, like a bot basically say bought, sold, you know, and they never had any intention of occupying those houses. And, you know, that's what we're seeing in my community like Montopolis. So we see these investors coming in, sweeping in. They don't care about our community. They care whatsoever. For them, this is purely a money-making venture. So anyway, you asked me, what would I do? And that would be one aspect of what I would do. But in general terms, it would be following the, you know, the pattern of what some scholars call degrowth, the like, responsible ratcheting down of overconsumption and wastage that is harming our planet, harming our communities, and realigning our economic and political systems to be more in harmony with nature. Okay, I like that. That, that sounds very nice. I like what you said. Um, do you think, though, that governing governments printing up swaths of money um, that, that's not really backed by much of anything, that they, that they just get to spend and give to um, cronies at whatever – their latest whim is is kind of contributing to that. No. You don't think so? Like no. when we print up tons of money to go to war Who in Ukraine and give and give arms to Who prints the money? Our, our Federal Reserve, which is the nothing Fed. federal. The Fed. That's the who prints company. the money. That's right. The Fed. The Fed does it. Not our government. Okay, who backs fine. the Fed? The banks. The private Fed. bank. The Wall Street. Okay. So you know. Okay, you, but either you, way, a sound money maybe a sound money system could help. Um, do you, like could help kind of mitigate some of that because when you have a sound money system as backed by gold or Bitcoin or something like that, people are only going to Bitcoin. spend. Yeah, absolutely. we're going to talk about. It. We are going to talk about that. <laughs> no, we're we are. Not. Yeah, we are. We got to. You don't want to talk. I don't. <laughs> Come on. You don't want to talk through it like in, in a very nice, polite, uh, fun type of manner. I wish I could talk about Bitcoin in a way that. Um... What don't you like about Bitcoin? It's fake. It's, what it's, do you mean it's, it's, fake? it's monopoly money. Oh, like the dollar that we have that's backed by nothing. No, it is backed by something. Uh, yeah, are forced to become. Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, see, <laughs> see, there we go. All right. Okay. I live in the real world. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go home to my nice house, to my nice family, have nice things, and I'm going to use nice money that says United States Treasury note on it. I'm not going to use monopoly money. My monopoly I'm money not... got me my house. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Not in Austin. Okay. Well, yeah, but I don't want to be an awesome. Okay, if you if, if you could buy a house using Bitcoin or whatever kind of crypto device you want to do, that is a private transaction between two private actors. But you don't. You really yeah. don't think after everything that's been going on these past. I, I'm just curious, right? Because I'm just honestly curious. Like, you really don't think after everything that's been going on these past two years with um, what's happening you with like. Ukrainians trying to leave the country with what's happened in Canada with the truck drivers, with um, countries in Latin America having insane levels of inflation and using um, Bitcoin to actually transact. No, like, they're you not. Don't, yeah, they are. There no, are literal articles about people in Venezuela one, and Cuba, one, one, Cuba using no, Bitcoin no. to transact with one another. Well, yeah, not, not in any way that is even close to scale. 
And that all that shit is, is being put out there by Bitcoin and crypto advocates who have engaged in a very well-funded PR campaign because it benefits them. So I think I think that a lot of crypto I, I do agree with what you have to say with a lot of other cryptocurrencies, because I do think a lot of like pretty much every other cryptocurrency with the exception of Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. All of them are. I don't think the, the, the concept scheme. itself, think... the concept itself is a diversion. First of all, you know, as somebody who's interested in making the world a better place, somebody who believes in giving the rabble genuine hope for transforming their plight and allowing people to be able to, you know, have better lives for themselves, their community, for their families, for their children. This entire crypto thing has been a gigantic pyramid scheme. It's a it's a it's a you know, it's a disgrace uh, I've watched the last six to ten months of what has happened to most of the crypto universe. But that always happens after every with, bull market. With pleasure. Well, that okay. always that, that, that's that, that's a uh, reoccurring theme that happens after every single bull market no. cycle. This has literally happened after every. This no. has had a historical precedent of happening the exact same fashion no. in every single bull market. No, no, it hasn't. Yes, it has. Uh, no. In 2018, something very similar happened. In 2018 and 2013, Bitcoin crashed by 90 percent after it hit a thousand dollars. Like that is a consi- like that is actually consistent. What is happening is a consistent feature of how this is working right now until it becomes a global reserve asset. Yeah, I, I, we're, let me put it to you this way: <laughs> I'm a college professor. Uh, okay, you're not. Okay, let me just put it that way. I, uh, okay. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, no, I, the, the, <laughs> the, you know, I'm going to pull rank here. You can okay? pull, that's fine. All right. I'm going to pull rank here. You know, I'm, but, a, I'm a former naval officer in the United States Navy. You have never put on a uniform to serve this country and, and taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of this country. There are certain things that I've done and know that you have not. Now, you either agree or respect that or you don't no, and, well, that's, I am, I am and, that, and that's fine i you're, respect that but i respect that and I, I disagree I res- with you on and absolutely on this issue. absolutely and, 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 and be and respectful with how i'm communicating absolutely why I disagree with you. absolutely you are but you know the fundamental facts behind your beliefs uh convey a sense of religious fanboyism that you are not so? I, I know so well if i had they don't f- they're not with they, they don't have an intellectual foundation um having sound money where i can where i have control over my own sovereignty if my money is in a hard wallet that can't be confiscated by um governments or other entities is, is fantasy no like no it. if you want to put money and keep it in your mattress nobody's going to stop you no but i mean like <laughs> that's great when you, I had, like, you, okay. do, you're, you can do that now so you're, you're aware that there are certain like like you know jackson hinkle is right Jason Hinkle? Ja- yeah, Jason Hinkle. Some he's um yeah he wrote the like divide. on YouTube or something like that, and he's been like critis- critical about the Ukraine, like really critical. There's a guy named Jackson Hinkle or something. Oh, Jackson like. Hinkle. Yeah, I don't know. Who's been like really critical about like what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and criticizing like um, how we're going about things and okay. YouTube, PayPal, and all these other um, centralized entities demonetized him. And so, like, he's not able oh, to, like, okay. yeah. Okay. So he's not able to get money from using these entities because he's speaking out and using a power well, voice yeah. to speak out against censorship and oppression, right? No, no. You know, but you, but you know what they, but you know what they cannot confiscate, can't confiscate your Bitcoin if it's on a hard wallet. Um, with with Trudeau and the Canadian truckers, you had um, they they were going to people's homes and freezing bank accounts last February to anybody who gave money to the. They're Can- doing that to Russia. They did that to Putin and, and all of the Russian oligarchs. They free they froze the assets yeah. of the Russian so state. So having having a little bit of money in something like Bitcoin is a sound and intelligent um method of insurance no, for that over a long No, because time. you can't buy shit with Bitcoin. Yes, you can. Well, you cannot. I accept like I literally accept um payments for You do. Cash. The fact that you do something does not mean 99.999% of the rest of the world does it. But that's because they choose that not to. That is like to. literally the opposite of what a college education should teach. But that's you. because they're that's because people are choosing not to. Like you ha- anybody has that ability to Does set it up a matter account? that that's the way it is? Let's not talk about fantasy of what I wish to be the case. Let's talk about what is the case. Well, yeah. You cannot go to Dairy Mart or any of these establishments located around here and pay for a gallon of milk with fucking Bitcoin. No, you, you can't do you, it. You cannot, but you can hold workshops and you can um, use a platform and you could hold events and, and meetups to educate other business owners to accept right. Bitcoin if that's their choice. Nobody's saying you can't. Don't confuse the two. All right. Okay. Don't don't get it mixed up. Oh, I'm don't, not. I'm just saying. I'm don't just get like it presenting twisted. how something like that has value. I'm just literally presenting how you can how come, it you, has value. You can have an orgy right here tomorrow if you want, and 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 deal with the consequences. Okay. You can do. You have the freedom to do these things. I'm not saying you can't do these things. I'm just saying, at a you know, as a policy matter, as a, an analysis of social and economic reality, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are a fantasy. Okay. You are entitled to like a person who is a Mormon. 
or who is a member of the Church of Scientology, you are perfectly entitled to evangelize <laughs> your fucking view of well, the world. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't. You're, this is a free country. Just don't confuse it with the way the world actually is. But, 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 but um, you're the one who seems more passionate in opposition to Bitcoin than I am in terms of talking about why I think it has value. I don't think that the Church of Mormon and Church of Scientology have value either. It doesn't, you know, they can do whatever they want to do. It's a free country. Just, just I have the right to say no. I'm not interested. You have, right. you have that right. You 100% have that right. No one should force you to use a method of account that you do not feel comfortable using. Anything. Not just any method yeah. of account. You know, if I want to do something, look, I have children. I have okay. responsibilities. Right. Okay. I don't have time to engage in the pithy leisure okay, of thinking about, you know, using Bitcoin to buy things. I actually have to make sure that my children are educated. I have to live in the real world, okay? Now, I have a certain conception of a world that I think would be better, some things that I would hope How to be able kids? to. Uh, they're teenagers and, okay. I, and I have a 10-year-old. Do your, do your teenagers, question, do your teenagers ever use, do, use Cash App? No. Like, no. they don't get paid, like, they don't have Cash App or, like, they send money through Cash App or no. them or anything like no. that? No, no. Okay. I keep I keep my kids away from uh, from technology that I think is bad for them as much as possible. So I limit their use. You know, like for instance, they don't have a smartphone; they have a regular phone. That's good. Okay. I, I I like that actually. I didn't uh, get a smartphone until I was like eighteen. That's but right. I was also older, so that's yeah. right. You know, any of these different things. You know, I think a responsible parent now today should be doing with their kids. Uh, you know, electronic payments of money. Uh, it's the way yeah, fine i use apple pay i like apple pay you know uh and i but that said i also appreciate the value of cash uh, i appreciate it. i listen you wait, you're talking to the choir right now for you know so uh you know you, you, you know you, cash you know, you know, you know as a as a scholar of slavery <laughs> they used to say back in the day during the days of the slave trade cash is king yes there, I, there's actually a really good quote i think it was by a planter named thomas affleck who once said Nothing does as well as the cash. <laughs> so, you know, in the 19th century, you know, in the heyday of American slave trading, that's how transactions were conducted. I, I, and there were specific reasons for that. Uh, today, you know, I, I get the, you know, some of the arguments that critics of, of currencies uh, make. There is a, a correlation between money and power. No question about it. Including the mechanisms of how the money is made. Okay. It does not follow, though. That systems that are not subject to proper democratic control, such as cryptocurrencies, are the answer. Okay, and that is probably my baseline but objection. Isn't isn't like um, a network that's controlled by a decentralized group of de decentralized group of node operators who have to agree to a consensus to validate no. different trends? No. Is it, that literally is no, no. We, no, we learned. We just learned in the crash over the past six months. That that was a bunch of bullshit. Well, that's it's the, the reason, same fucking yeah, Elon know, Musk worshiping right, you know Silicon why? Valley you, tech bro dickheads. Fred, 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 okay, you know who control the money? Okay, but do you, do you know why um, Bitcoin and other and other assets kind of crashed the way in which they did? Look, bottom line for me is democracy. Right, but I think p part of having a, like a democratic society is understanding why certain things are occurring, just to get a nuanced perspective about. There's why no nuance this, here. Well, the the, 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 the entire right. the entire infrastructure is not controlled democratically. There are no elections for these people. They are self-selected. They are self-acting. They control the mechanisms. That's not democracy. Well, you're correct about the proof of stake tokens that are not Bitcoin. What you said about the, what you, what you just said is 100% true about 99% of other cryptocurrencies that are not Bitcoin. What, you're telling me Bitcoin is there's a, there, there are elections like you can run for. No, there's can, not elections. You can, you can run for no, president no, of Bitcoin. No, no, no. You can run not, for. You can run for the house. Of, you can run for the Senate of no, Bitcoin. No, no, no. There's no, that's not what I'm talking about. There's not like elections, but um, you do have a lot of problems with other cryptocurrencies where you have a central um, governing body and a small group of people that are making consensus decisions for everybody else that uses that protocol. And Bitcoin does not do that because every bot, every node operator has an equal say in terms of what transaction gets validated and what works. And you don't know who the, you don't even know who the head of, you don't even know the name of the, the real name of the actual creator of Bitcoin. Yeah, okay. that, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, let's, I move think it's just, let's move on. All right. Let's, let's talk on. about local elections. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Let's talk about local elections. This is fun. This is fun arguing about Bitcoin. I'm only saying this because I like you and you're my friend, and it, I think it's a good thing to no, have. And no, a lot no. of people, no. you know, did lose a lot of money in the crash because they buy things when they when everything gets hyped up on CNBC and um, all the financial channels. No, and it was whenever. the fucking billboards and shit. And yeah, the fucking they, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Hollywood stars like Matt yeah, fucking Damon. Well, none of these motherfuckers well, who got paid shit tons of money to endorse this well, ridiculousness. You, okay, they, they're hiding like like ostriches with their heads in the sand, and they're not being held Fred, accountable. You gotta, you gotta understand something though, and it's that when the celebrities come out, that's the time to sell, not the time to buy. Oh. The time to buy something is literally yeah. right now when everybody's what, telling you that what, you are an what, idiot what, for what, buying what? it. Oh, so, so basically, <laughs> your argument is is that I'm smart and those guys are stupid. Yes, that's literally yeah. the, that's <laughs> yes. the definition of a fucking Ponzi scheme. That's literally the definition of a Ponzi scheme. I, I mean, I've literally seen guys in Times Square with fucking three card money and shells say stupid shit like that. Come How, on, that's man. not stupid. Though. It is. It's completely stupid. It's based upon the idea that I'm going to get enriched by you and your network fucking doing what I did, not because you made it something a product that's superior. I cannot stand Elon fucking Musk, okay, for all kinds of reasons. Yeah, but, but I, there's I, no denying that that guy, uh, for the most part, with Tesla, let's just keep it restricted to, okay, with Tesla, to right. that aspect of his business operations. He has made a product. He has made a product um, with which most people who own it are happy. Now, yes, it's been subsidized by public money. Again, I have a gazillion objections to the man. But the guy is, number one, he has an engineering degree from Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, he's not in many ways a stupid guy. And he again, he's making actual products, consumer products that people enjoy. And they're products that, by and large, are better. And for a while, we're better than the competition. Yeah, I agree. I don't have a problem with any of that. That's good. Those are yeah. good things. And hey, okay? listen, if you if you happen to have been a Tesla shareholder, you, you, it's also good. Yeah, you yeah. Know, if you invested just, in Tesla, yeah. if you're a Tesla you know, shareholder, now it's... again, there are many again many criticisms. You get it, but you know, notice that that's not the same with a Ponzi scheme. Okay, I'll tell you a story that you don't know. Sure, sure. When I first came to Austin, um, I came up from Corpus Christi. I had been discharged from the Navy. Was going to graduate school here at UT. This is 1995. I'd been here a couple of years before that, but I'm not going to make... That's a different story. I moved here permanently in August of 1995, actually about 27 years ago, to go to grad school at UT. I was looking for a job. I'm going through the one ads because okay. that's what you did back then. And I saw an ad for a company called Equinox International, run by a guy based in Las Vegas named Bill Gould, who spelled that his... That sounds like a pretty... Gula. That he, just sounds like a weird name. To he you. All right. he okay. spelled his name with two D's. G O U L D D. Okay. okay. And you, it was made to look like you were going to a job interview. So I went up north on the corner of 183 and Lamar, over there where Kim Fung is, in that little area up there, where you were. You went there for what you thought would be a job interview. It wasn't a fucking job interview whatsoever. Okay. It was a pyramid scheme based upon natural products, mainly the thing they sold was water filters, water filters for your shower yeah. because of all of the bad stuff in the water. But they had a whole range of different health products, natural products, everything from toothpaste, okay. soap. They had this like this mineral drop kit. You would drop this in water and you would feel energized. It would like had some magic shit in it, okay? And the idea was for you to do what? To, for you to purchase a certain amount of product Five hundred to a thousand dollars, if you could. More would be great, and then to immediately go to all your friends and family, get them into your network, and have them do the same thing, and you would get a cut of a percentage of what they sold. So you're comparing the, this multi. Let's like selling Cutco knives. Like you're it's multi level marketing at its worst. And the Cutco. guy ended up going to jail. Okay, Fred. Um, here's my last r rebuttal to this. Okay, I'm buying Bitcoin and owning Bitcoin because I want self sovereignty over my own finances, okay? Yeah. I feel as though Bitcoin, um, from a digital standpoint, gives me the best perspective and the best opportunity and means of doing so. If oh, the no. price of Bitcoin, wait, have, hold on, no, hold on. No. If the price, I if think the, that's great. Okay. I don't have a problem with that at all. All right, if the price of Bitcoin goes up, awesome. My net worth is going up. And guess what? If the price of Bitcoin goes down, then I have more resources to own more Bitcoin and have a greater sense of self-sovereignty. So the way I look at it is like, I'm not buying Bitcoin. I'm not buying Bitcoin specifically to get rich. I don't give a shit about that, okay? I'm buying that so that I can have more self-sovereignty over my own finances. No, I don't have a problem with that at all. And that's you're, but, No, you're basically, okay. what you're doing there, what you just described, I don't have any disagreement with whatsoever. Okay. You're an investor. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You're, Bitcoin for you is an investment. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. 
Where I have objections is the social and economic claims in terms of macroeconomics that Bitcoin zealots make. Okay, about it replacing fiat money and all these other sorts of things and how it's a, a pathway to escape poverty. All this bullshit. That is complete made up bullshit well, that has everything to do with, with MLM and religion, I, not actual facts. I think that Bitcoin can be used to accept poverty if people are smart about how they purchase no, and go. Yeah, no, it cannot. No, 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 it cannot. That's no, it cannot. I improve my, I improve my net worth. I'm good for insane, you. But I'm saying like I'm literally one of those people that like. Well, good for you. But, you know, again. That is not college thinking. Collegiate thinking allows you for the first time, perhaps, in your educational life to realize there's shit beyond you and your orbit. Sure. Okay? And that we actually have science and we actually have statistics and we actually have ways of measuring shit okay. that goes beyond your little tiny scale and the shit that you do. Right. Okay? I understand that. But if you- I know say, this is a problem for the right in general. I'm, okay? It's like something you, you can talk to these people one-on-one, -on -one, but when you start making arguments about poverty, about which I know a lot, okay, they get confused. Because they think the shit that they know, uh, and you always get the same story. Oh, I saw some fat lady at the at the checkout counter with like a six pack. Of well, there's a lot of people on the right that grew up in extreme and, and, poverty you know, too, though, Fred. Quite a few, and yeah. Uh, yeah, quite a few, and we can have a conversation and, and, yeah. with, those, with those people. And, and I but, think that we but, should. I, I want to use this to segue to the next talking point, but yeah, yeah. continue. Okay. So anyway, you know, we, 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 you need, when you have a conversation about social issues and about you know things that have to do with public policy. You have to have the capacity to understand things, not just in micro, but macro terms. That's really what it boils down to. But in terms of your experience with, with Bitcoin you know, or other crypto, whatever, that's your private business. And what you described, I, can't, I don't have any objection to whatsoever. That is basically what it is at its best. It's an investment. It's like anything you can buy and hope it'll appreciate in value. I, who could disagree with something like that? No, exactly. And I think that generally speaking, if you take like, you know, let, you, let's say you get a cash app payment, right? And you just take your, whatever people pay you in cash and just convert it into Bitcoin. You're risking very little. If you're getting small amounts of money on cash app every week or something like that, and you just convert it to Bitcoin, you're risking very little, especially at the price that it is right now. If you have a, like a long time, a low time preference for like four or five years, you're risking very little to gain a whole lot is what I think. No, no, if you I, do it, if you do a, it from that perspective, I haven't done the data work. I mean, you know, I, if I mean to me, if you have two hundred thousand, I would say you know let it ride in a, you know a no load index fund and put some money in a, in a you know in a money market account. Yeah, and watch it well, grow. I think I think that if you had two hundred grand right now, I wouldn't say I would not tell somebody in good conscience, hey, put it all into Bitcoin. You're definitely going to get rich. Like I think that's that's horrible. Like that's really that's a really bad faith discussion. I think a lot of people in that's in this space, um, and a lot of crypto YouTubers are very guilty of speaking in bad pay, uh, faith and making these moon boy predictions, saying that you're going to get super rich in X Y Z. I fuck that. I hate those people. Okay, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. But if you're going to have this discussion in reality, you're like, okay, well you got 200 grand, right? Um, what are you? What amount of that money are you willing to like not touch for five or ten years that you could put away that has the potential to um, grow the most? No, no. And I think that like if you I look said, at it from that perspective, yeah, then that's yeah. I think I think it's that's, your money. Yeah, I it, think it's your money. You do what you want. You know, some people would stuff it in a mattress. That's fine. Some people want to invest it in Bitcoin. I don't have a problem with that. It's your private money. It's I don't. I, I, there is no disagreement there whatsoever. Okay. Again. It's the claims that people have about Bitcoin as a currency, Bitcoin as the solution for poor people, Bitcoin in social uh, and economic terms. Those are not just overblown claims. They are empirically false. OK, but, uh, but again, if you, whatever you want to do with your private money and your private affairs, by all means, I mean, that's like anybody investing in anything. And that's great. Yeah. Um, anyway, we're talking about the right. And no, we're talking the about right the city and poverty, election. and and we're yeah, we did we, we totally glossed over that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and I think this could tie into the city council too. But um, a lot of people on the right, um, a lot of poor people, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people that that seem like they're very poor are, are seem to be gravitating more towards being on the right now than being on the left. Um, and a lot of more working people and small business owners are becoming a lot more right leaning these past couple years. It seems. Than going left. Yeah, I don't know about that. Mm. I, you know, we we had a. Uh, it's th these kinds of things tend to fluctuate. I mean, we live in a very fickle uh, information age where information moves very quickly, electronic information, and people are able to be manipulated very easily because of social media. Um, I'm not so sure that you know any of that is true. I mean, 
let's see what happens. The, you know, I don't get sort of too involved in the X's and O's of electoral politics. I mean, I'm a social scientist. I watch more general trends. Okay. Uh, and, you know, one election cycle isn't necessarily enough to sort of give you an indicator about which way people are leaning. Look, this populism thing in 2016 could have gone one of two ways. It could have gone the Trump way or the ba- the Bernie Sanders way. I agree with you. Okay. I think if Bernie won the nomination, yeah. he would have been president. It would have been, you know, a different, you know, it, it, but it didn't go that way. It went yeah. the Trump way. And Trump, you know, engaged in a certain type of populist rhetoric that people found popular. And that's why they supported him. Of course, he ended up enacting policies for the very oligarchs that he railed against. And, you know, he, I mean, he was Trump. He was, you know, and he's, yeah, he's a but liar. That, but, a, but also a lot of small business owners and a lot of people who owned it. Like, basically, if you owned investable assets, he was the greatest president. No, of- no, no, not at all. You don't think so? If no. you were an investable asset, if you had a bunch of investable no. assets in 2016? No, no, no. Considering how much your portfolio and your net worth is going to grow? Like, there is no. something to be said about that, though. No, you don't- no. Okay. No, no. I mean, this is just not, complete- not Not at the risk of sounding selfish, but. No, it's completely overblown. Again. A lot, you're right that you do have to sort of define what your frame of reference is, what your yardstick is. If you think giving people, giving more money to the owning class, giving more in a, at a time of rampant inequality, not seen since the Gilded Age, where people are having difficulty feeding themselves, being healthy, educating themselves, housing themselves. If you think giving obscene tax decreases to the people that are causing those very conditions to occur, is sound policy, then yes, you can have that perspective. I was more in support of Senator Sanders, who was going to implement, I think, uh, a better populist program that would have been more bottom up, not top down. I don't believe in trickle down prosperity. Okay? Oh, that's all that that's a scam. OK. Yeah. I so, you know, so, you know, but again, the Democrats no longer, if they ever were, are the are the party of working people? Well, okay. yes, they are. The, they are a party of Wall Street, and that's why they had to kill Bernie Sanders' political prospects. And, and a lot of it also had to do with the ego of the Clintons in 2016, particularly Hillary Clinton, who to this day can't get over the fact that she lost to the Orange Monster, and the reasons were of her own fault. They have nothing to do with you know, the, her supporters. Can blame Bernie all they want. Just like Gore people can blame Nader for what happened in 2000 or 2004, they can they can they can do that till the cows come home. They're both wrong, okay? Gore should have never lost to George W. Bush, and Hillary Clinton should have never lost to Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton should have never been the nominee. Bernie Sanders should have been the nominee. Oh, I agree with you fully. I didn't I didn't even vote until I voted for the Green Party in 2016 mm. as a protest vote. Yeah, for Jill Stein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I voted for Jill Stein. Um, but. What I, what I was saying, though, is that, like, today's Democratic Party and the way in which I feel they have been doing things and the way in which they've been communicating has, I, I think, has been so off-putting that regular people like myself are just going right because I just don't want to have these people make decisions for well, me. Well, there is one trend that I think some observers have pointed out that probably has now salience, stronger salience than it did before, although its impact can be overstated sometimes. Namely, that not only has the Democratic Party become the party of Wall Street, it now has forsaken sort of people living in the flyover states. You know, people who work for a living, small entrepreneurs, business owners like yourself. Uh, and it now represents urban liberals who are highly college educated. Yes, coastal elites. Okay. Uh, and the voting patterns seem to bear some of this out. Uh and that's a problem. Yes, I agree that that is that is some that's a worrying trend that if it persists, will continue to erode what little credibility the Democratic Party has left. Because because you're seeing a change in the Latino community, for instance, in Texas and Florida in particular, Latinos are voting for Republicans in greater numbers than they have ever in many ways ever ever. OK, that's not a function of the fact that Latinos all of a sudden love Republicans is that they're so disgusted with the Democrats. There's that. And there's also, you know, the the pro-family dynamic, like the, the pro-family and the Catholic backgrounds, and that that could be kind no. of sort You don't think so? No, no. no. Look, the, the, the guy who, who patented that, the guy who trademarked that was John Kennedy, who's the first okay. Catholic president, All right. who's a Democrat. Okay. Um, fair. All right. Yeah, nobody wants – they don't want to be called Latinx anymore, and then they don't want their concerns of – 
what's that's, happening at the well, that, you know, right there, that right there is a good ind indicator of what we just said. Who the fuck came up with this shit about calling it Latin X? Forgot what was something wasn't working. You know, that is the type of stuff that college educated coastal elites who go to fancy schmancy leather coated college campuses dream up. It has nothing to do with a person of Mexican descent working in scorching heat in a real in the construction of a new real estate subdivision in Texas that they're not going to be able to live in. That's <laughs> that right. They can't live in. But the other guys. But it's a sanctuary a city. Yo, you know, I mean, right. On. But you're a Latinx and Black Lives Matter. That's on the board right next no. to you. But no one's no one gives no. a shit about wanting to. Listen and who's to gotten these proof. jobs? Yeah. These you know these diversity, equity, and inclusion jobs. I don't necessarily I, disagree with all, some of the things that they're doing, but that to me was always a scam. It just seems like a grift, right? Well, I think a lot of what the city does with addressing inequality and doing stuff like that is obviously just a money making scam for like the heads of these non profit, like the heads no, of these non profits or the heads or developers. I, 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 I and don't stuff think like it's that, that obvious. Look, there there is. Oh, we got five minutes. All right. Okay, well, five Sorry. minutes. Okay, so there Sorry. Are, <laughs> oh, that was quick. No, no, we have uh, time flies. We're having fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, look, I mean, we have historical racism and other forms of oppression that we need to talk about okay this stuff that they're doing though okay is not the way to do that okay i'm all fine with having conversations uh about the history of slavery and about you know various other forms of uh of historical injustices but you know the, the include uh, i mean i i predicted from the beginning that the city's uh, new, uh, what was that office that they created? The, D the equity D office. Oh, yeah. Okay. That that was never, you know, it, 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 you know, this, you know, none of that truly confronted power. And that's the single biggest question anybody who claims to have an insurgent bone needs to ask themselves. How is anything that I am talking about challenging power? If the rich can't control it, if they can't co-opt it, Okay, then yeah, you might yeah. start having the genesis of something. Well, but otherwise, they the just party, co opted the party. The party, you know, I'll say this to, in closing: the party of working people, um, the part, the party that I thought was about working people, right, and helping to you know fix the environment is is the party of um, lockdowns, forced masking, vaccine mandates. Um, excluding people based on their health decisions, censoring um, dissenting speech, and yeah, throwing become, masks and needles into the ocean and taking private jets they, to they've, private they've, sites. They've become Republicans that way. Yeah, I mean, it used, to, used, used to be Jerry Falwell on the moral majority and Pat Robertson used to wag the moralizing finger at people. Yeah. Ah, you know, now it's the Democrats. You know, yeah. It's, it's yeah, and it's gross. Yeah. Today's Democrats are the same, are no different than Bush and Cheney Republicans in a lot of ways in terms of how they're communicating and what's been happening it's just gone it's just they just put on a different yeah, color tie i don't know about i don't know if i go like. that far i don't know if i go that far bush and cheney are pretty bad they got they're us evil into, they got us into a pretty bad situation if it wasn't for bush and cheney you wouldn't even have trump probably true you would not even have Donald probably trump. true if it wasn't for bush and cheney that, that wouldn't even be the case right now let's talk about the city council quickly before we real move. quick we got last, last two minutes so what do you want to know well i, I my my <laughs> hypothesis about the city council is you're gonna pretty much get the same old shit that you've been dealing with for the past <laughs> eight years because no no candidate that has um, an original thought in their body um, <laughs> has like no candidate with an original thought in their body who I like has an ounce of charisma um, or social media reach to actually communicate their ideas um, in a manner that reaches a broad audience. The only person that I do like a lot actually. Um, who has no chance because of where he's located is the guy that's running against Natasha's Clint Rary. I like that guy a lot. No, that, no. that guy's all, no, that guy's great. No, he's not. What? That guy like shared his vegetables. No, that, that guy like no, shares his vegetables no, no. and grows a sustainable no, farm. That guy is no, awesome. No, I love Clint. No, no, he doesn't know the first thing about about city. Government. But we're not, you know, we're not here to talk. We're not here to talk shit. But I, I love, right. I love that guy. Well, good, well, good for I, you. I, Are I, you district I, one voter? No. That's what I'm saying. Like, okay. I, I can't. I have to, okay. <laughs> no. okay, so it won't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Support and vote for Melanie House Dixon in that race. That would be. And in District 3, vote for Noe Elias, Jose Noe Elias. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the mayoral race. I don't really care There's about nobody District good. Like, that's what I'm saying. I don't really care about District 5. I don't really care about, you know. But that's the thing. Hey, jealous. She's never done anything for me or my part of town. Or like, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but that's what I'm saying. My, my, that's my philosophy. Generally speaking, on the people that are, you know, that that have any kind of modicum of common sense. Nobody has any an ounce of charisma in their body, from what I see, to communicate. Well, it's those. not about charisma. Just I mean, charisma is one aspect of being a political candidate. You got to know what the hell you're doing. Well, you got to be qualified. Charisma, okay? knowledge, and the ability to um, reach people on a broad scale. It's not none no, of those people. No. To win an election, no, yeah. I, I, 
gov- winning an election and governing are not the same thing. That's true, but the people we that have are- plenty of people who work on the social media charisma. What we don't have is qualified people who know what the fuck they're doing. We don't. And the people I don't that- want a carpenter or like an open heart surgeon, you know, who looks good but doesn't know how to fucking do open heart surgery. Government, what? government. You don't want these- a skydiving instructor who's never jumped out of a no. plane. What are you okay. talking? What? We, we need people. <laughs> you know, first you got to be qualified, then you can work on the charisma. Okay, let's let's get That's, back to basics. We said the same thing. There's no qualified candidates with common sense that have the ability to communicate their beliefs in a way that no, appeals see, I don't to the masses. That's not high on the qualifications list. First thing you got to know is how big is the city budget? How many employees does the city have? What are our basic tax rates? Do you know the answers to these questions? I do not know any of that stuff. Well, that, there you go. You're not qualified. I agreed. I'm, I'm right. in Johnson City. I'm, I'm in Johnson City riding a tricycle, trolling people, and and talking to people, and talking to smarter people than me on the on my pedicab. I, under, <laughs> I understand. I understand. I'm not running. That's I why know. I can cuss and say the things I'm saying. <laughs> if I was running for something, I'd have to be all polite, <laughs> like right. the, like the other candidates you've had on on this pedicab, some of I whom know. I don't like. I, I we, like I said, that's that's a private. That's a private time talk. Sure, right now. sure, sure. Uh, okay. for right now. Okay. All right, Fred. How do we get a hold of you? This is fun. <laughs> oh, just go to fredmcgee.com. You, I have you got de- a Twitter. Come on, I have decent you're so lectures. Smart. No, Listen, no, you're, no, you're, no. You're, Twitter, you're... Twitter is ephemeral, and I, you know I don't really use. I, I, you know, I spew things on Twitter sometimes that I don't actually even believe. What? It's an what? it's an avatar. <laughs> You know, if you really want to have a serious engagement with me, go to my webpage at fredmcgee.com. Send me an email, uh, and we can engage that way. Social media to me is just, it's like it's like crypto. It's an intermediary between me having engagement with people directly. Like, for instance, we're engaging directly now, and that's what I prefer. Yeah. So, so yeah, but, you know, you know I'm on Fred McGee. Fred underscore McGee at, uh, is my Twitter handle. But fredmcgee.com would be the best way to get a hold of me. And, right. you know, obviously we couldn't talk for as long got, as I would have liked. But You know, listen, we got to have you come back. You know, like, it's always a pleasure, Fred, and I uh, yeah. hope you come back again. And uh, yeah. I got to situate this. I got to start having three-hour-long podcasts like our boy Rogan. You know, that's what I got to start doing. And, well, uh, he has a nice studio, and he's a multimillionaire. So, you know, different situation. In, in due time, you know, in due time. Yeah. All right, well, that'd be great. You know, I'd love to sit in an air conditioning office. Yeah. I, I don't know. This has, yeah, I kind of like this has, nature, but this is like this is the this is Austin. This is this Austin, has, Austin, has, Austin vibe this, right here. This, this is an Austin a, experience. Yeah, this, this, is the most, uh, this is the most Austin podcast in Austin. Fred. Let's <laughs> leave it at that. Fred, thank you for coming on, man. I love it. All thank right, you. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. <laughs>